And I want to let you know that's because you're reading the wrong Bible. We fail to see the big picture. You see, we don't grieve like those who don't have hope. When will the rapture occur? I've got the answer. This morning, I'm going to uh, kind of talk about a controversial subject. Okay? And um, with that... Uh, always comes the fear of uh, offending people, okay? And, uh, and it's, it's a rightful fear, okay? Especially when we're talking about something that uh, is not a salvation issue, okay? Now, if we were going to talk about and debate whether or not Jesus was crucified, uh, was uh, laid in the grave for three days, and was resurrected, okay, that's a salvation issue. If we were going to argue about Jesus' deity, salvation issue, okay? Jesus was God incarnate who came and dwelt here among us and lived a perfect and sinless life. And after uh, being uh, crucified, was um, uh, laid in a grave and laid there for three days and was resurrected. Salvation, okay? Because we don't have Jesus without those things. Okay, we just have another good man. But we have other things that aren't salvation, issues. And we can have differing opinions about them. Okay? Our rule here at the bridge is, is we can have different opinions on non-salvation issues and still be brothers and sisters and not argue or fight or be divisive or cause problems. Amen? Okay? So as I talk about this and we go through it, okay, no arguing, no fighting, nobody throw anything at me, okay? Got it? I'm watching you, Mike, okay? I'm just saying. Um, we're going to talk about the rapture this morning. And like I said, that always brings about this, the different views and opinions. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter um, 12, verse 1, that he didn't want us to be ignorant about spiritual gifts. Okay, And so he gives us some teaching on it. Is it exhaustive? I don't believe that it is exhaustive. Okay, I don't find in there, I find this, that like the gift of helps in there. The gift of service. But I don't find electronic technician and computer nerd. Okay? It just gives us a broad brush with things. You know, he says um, in first, or 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, that he doesn't want us to be ignorant of the strategies and the plans of the devil. In Romans eleven twenty five, he says he didn't want us to be ignorant about Israel and its future. And here Paul's going to give us some things to know about the rapture. So if you have your Bibles, open them to um, 1 Thessalonians Chapter 4, we're just continuing to march through it, and uh, as we march through it, we, we just cover everything that's there. So if I preach on, preached on your sin last week, don't worry, I'm preaching on somebody else's sin this week, okay? If it's something you struggle with, don't understand, it just all comes around, and it's so it, it's here, and we're going to preach on it and, and try to grow in, in our understanding of God's Word and His desire for us. But Paul, writing to the church there in Thessalonica, says, Now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to believers who have died, so you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will be raised from the grave, and then together with them, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air then we will be with the Lord forever. And I don't know if it has verse 18, but it says that we shall comfort one another with these words. 
You know, somebody here is already sitting and say, well, Pastor Curtis, rapture, does, the word rapture does not occur in the Bible. And I want to let you know that's because you're reading the wrong Bible. Okay? Now, somebody's really ticked at this moment. What do you mean? Okay, when I did that in Gateway, I had one of the guys who's been a Christian most of his life looked at me and was shaking his head like, mm, no, Pastor Curtis. Okay, no, you are reading the wrong Bible, okay? The Greek word, and I'm not a Greek theologian or don't even try to pronounce, but the Greek word is harpozo, harpozo, yeah, okay? It's H-A-R-P-A-Z-O. That is the Greek word, okay? The New Testament is written in what? Greek, okay? That word literally means, literally means to snatch, okay, something away. It means to grab by the collar and take up by force. Literal translation of it. Well, after it was written in Greek, the next language that they translated the Bible into was Latin. And Latin, and again, I am not a Latin scholar, okay? I won't even try Latin, okay? They translated the word into raptos, R-A-P-T-U-S, raptus, something like that, close enough, okay? That's where we get the English word rapture. Okay, so it's not, listen, we as Christians sometimes want to strain at a gnat, and we swallow a whole camel. We swallow the camel. We fail to see the big picture. We fail to see what God is trying to teach us with a broad stroke. And we get disconnected right off the get-go because rapture doesn't occur. Well, it occurred in the Latin, and that's where we took the word to help us understand what is going, what, what's, what God is talking about and what will take place. You see, guys, Everything I'm going to say from this point on is contingent, okay? It's contingent on one thing, no matter what view you take, okay? If you don't have a ticket to get on the bus, you can't get on the bus no matter what time it arrives, no matter what time it leaves. And I don't like to refer to salvation as a ticket, but unless you know Jesus... Okay? Unless you know him personally as your Lord and Savior, it doesn't matter when the rapture occurs. You won't be there. I jokingly have said on, that my greatest fear is, is the rapture would occur on Sunday morning. Because some of us would leave and some of us wouldn't. Some of us would be caught up in the air, and others would be sitting here. So if you don't know Jesus this morning, this should bring great fear into your life. If you do, comfort one another with these words. Because they're words of hope. Words of hope in, in the midst of a very difficult and hard time. You know, the believers in Thessalonica, you know, were asking questions about dying and what happens. And, you know, uh, the believers have been taught that Christ would return at any moment, at any time. The imminent return of Christ. Well, we're 2,000 years late, later and then some of us are scratching our heads and saying, well, it didn't happen. Or if it happened, it happened secretly. And all these other little things go on. Okay, now some of us in this room uh, uh, may have forgotten this time period in our life, okay? I don't want to mention names or anything, Mark, okay? But how many of you remember being left at home by your parents, home alone? Anybody besides me? Okay, get left home alone. And mom says, I will be back at 9 o'clock. Okay, awesome. I can live like hell up until 8.45. 
I can do anything I want until 8.45. Then I got 15 minutes to get the house in order, to get the blood cleaned up, to get the pictures moved where if we put a hole in the wall. Okay, I know none of you guys were that way. Mom got back, everything was good. Do you remember those days? But do you remember when mom said, I'm going to leave. And you go, well, when are you going to be back, mom? I don't know. I'll be back sometime this evening. Do you remember the fear it struck in you? Oh, my goodness, mom could come back at any time. She could arrive. I have to live like she's coming at any moment, at any time. Because if not, I'm going to get the living dog snot beat out of me. Anybody else live in that house? That's why he doesn't give us all the answers. He said, well, it's been 2,000 years. Guys, listen. It could be 2,000 years, one minute, one second, and Jesus comes. We're to live as if he should come at any moment. And the church was living that way, and they were having questions. Because, see, they thought that Jesus would, would, would come at any time, at any moment. And they were wondering, you know, what, what's happening? It's getting longer. People are dying that have given their life to Christ. And what's going to happen to them? And Because, see, dying is universal. Statistically, one out of one of us will die. Did you know that? I mean, nobody's getting out of here alive except at the point of the rapture and a couple other guys ahead of that. We're all going to die. We all have questions and we all wonder what's going to happen. You know, some of the believers feared that they, those who died had missed out on the kingdom of God and they wouldn't be a part of it. And, you know, Paul wanted them to understand what happens with death. Listen, the church in Thessalonica wasn't the only ones that were, were questioning what happens when we die. 2,000 years later, at funerals, I try to answer that question because there's so many questions that go on. Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, again, answering questions about death, says this, and I took it out of the King James because I think it, I just love the way it reads. But Paul said this, for this corruptible must put on in incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immor Im immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God which giveth us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in work for the Lord. For as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That's our hope, guys. That's our promise. That, listen, I'm looking forward, and the older I get, the more I look forward to it, okay? This body being transformed and putting on the corruptible, putting on uh, incorruptible clothes. That I'll be clothed in, in, in incorruptible skin and flesh, and I will have the hope and of a new body. Listen, I need a new body. My body aches. Anybody else? Okay. I want to put on that, and I want to have that victory that's found in Jesus, because literally, death has no victory over us. Our victory is found in Christ. But yet, Paul recognized that we all grieve. We all grieve at the death of a loved one. And that's okay that we grieve. But our grief, I did a funeral for... Uh, Mark's uh, daughter-in-law, or daughter-in-law, sister-in-law, Lois, just to, I, I helped with it. I did a part of it. Lois loved Jesus her entire life. Wonderful woman of God. Were there tears at that funeral? Yep, there were tears. But the resounding theme was one day, one day we'll be together. One day, she's in heaven right now. One day, one day we're all going to be together. I did a funeral 
a week later of the man who didn't know Christ. The tears were bitter. You see, we don't grieve like those who don't have hope. Because again, death is real. Listen, I still grieve the death of my grandfather and my father, my grandmother and my grandfather. But I don't grieve like one without hope. Paul says in verse 14, he says, For as much as we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. In other words, listen. The believers who had died were already presently in heaven with God. The same, uh, some falsely teach, listen, that we will, you know, we just lay in the grave until the, the last day, the last trumpet, the last sound, and that we're there and there's nothing. That's not true. What did Jesus say to the thief on the cross? Today, what? You shall be with me in paradise. Not in 2,000 years. Today. You see, believers who have died are already with the Lord. They are presently with God. They're enjoying the company and and the comfort of being with Jesus. And they haven't missed out on anything. In fact, they're enjoying, okay, they're enjoying being in the presence of the one who loved them enough to die for them and give them eternal life. Paul writing to the church in, in, in Corinth says, Um, Yes, we are fully confident that we would rather be away from these earthly bodies, for then we shall be at home with the Lord. We have the hope that when we die, and normally we preach this at funerals, but I think it's something that we should comfort one another with, not just at the time of death, but throughout the year and throughout our lifetimes. That this is not the end. But that when we die, we do go to be with heaven. He goes on in verses 15 and 16. He says, We tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still living, when the Lord returns, will we'll not meet him ahead of those who have died. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet, of, trumpet call of God. First, the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. Whether this was something that Paul got directly from Jesus, or it was something oral that was, had been taught and passed down as the words of Jesus, the point is still clear. Paul wanted us to know what happens in the end. He wanted believers to understand that whether they were dead or living, that they wouldn't miss out on the rapture and the kingdom of God. That they would be with, together forever with Him. And all believers shall enjoy the blessings of the rapture and of heaven. Now listen, when will the rapture occur? I've got the answer. I know the exact time, the exact moment when the rapture will occur. Whenever God says so. It ain't going to happen one minute sooner or one minute later. It's whenever he says so. Jesus was the one who said, listen, I don't even know what they, his disciples came and said, when is it going to, he said, I don't know. That's for the Father to know, not me or you. Listen, Christ, who is the Lord himself, will descend from heaven, for that is where he has been from the beginning and where he is after the resurrection. Acts 1.9. Christians, Christ's return will be unmistakable. There will be no secret rapture. There will be none caught up in some, you know, nobody knows what happens. No one will miss it. It will be sounded by the archangel who will shout and the trumpet blown by God. And those who are dead in Christ shall rise first and those who are left shall be caught up. Now listen, there's three, um, uh, whether these three things, the shout, the trumpet, okay? They all, whether they happen in sequence or they all describe what takes place at one time. The archangel, listen, is a high and holy angel. He's appointed for special tasks. 
the angels are going to be a part of this. Jesus says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of the person when he returns in, in, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Listen, there's so many people who have been sitting in church today that are ashamed of the message of Jesus. They don't live for him. They don't live in a wet manner that would please him. You have to be careful that we will not be found ashamed on that day. Listen, the Jews understood the significance of the trumpet. Why the trumpet would blow and signal the, uh, the start of this great celebration. In Numbers 10.10 10, God speaking through Moses says, Blow the trumpets in times of gladness to sounding them with, the, with an annual f- feast and the beginning of each month. And to blow the trumpets over the burnt offerings and the peace offerings, the trumpets will remind the Lord your God of His covenant with you. I am the Lord your God. Now see, at this trumpet, for, for some it will be a great celebration. The beginning of, uh, of peace and rest the beginning of our our time in heaven with God. For others, it'll be a trumpet of great sorrow. That's why I said it bothers me that it may happen on Sunday morning because people in church will know what's going on. They will have heard but never yielded. He goes on in verses 16 and 17 and says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First the Christians who are alive will raise from the graves, then together with them we who are still living and remain on earth will be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. After the dead have risen, those of us who are alive will be caught up into the presence of God, into the arms of Jesus. It says that it will be a cloud. Well, the cloud represents and symbolizes the presence of God. Exodus chapter 40. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, the people of Israel would set out on their journey and follow it. We also see in Acts 1 verse 9 that Jesus, after saying this, he was taken up into a cloud while they were watching and they could no longer see him. Now listen, there's differing views about whether the taking up, quote, the rapture of believers and the second coming occur at the same time. Again, there's differing views. These verses, though, provide a clear picture of what we call the rapture. But Paul does exactly as I stated earlier. He doesn't give us every detail, every moment, every time. Because I don't think he wants us to live like a bunch of kids that know when mom's coming home. Because listen, I know all you guys. I know me. I'd live like hell up until 15 minutes before the time to go. Repent, clean up the house, okay? For my brother and I, it was clean up the blood, okay? That's not how he wants us to live. He wants us to live in such a way that would bring honor and glory to his name. The question is, are you ready when it happens, not if, when it happens? Because if you don't have a ticket to get on, you can't get on. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have no hope. The key is to know Christ, whether living or dead. To know Christ. He is our hope. Now, there are four main views about when and how this will take place. And I have four minutes and 21 seconds to cover a two year uh, dissertation. And I'm going to try and cover it real quick. Okay, are you ready? Okay, view number one 
all millennialists. Okay? I didn't put them up there on purpose because I was trying to define it and make it a little better. All millennialists believe that God's promises regarding the end times are figurative and will not be literally fulfilled, particularly the thousand-year reign of Christ on earth. Okay? This is the view, this view is the view that I struggle the most with and the view that honestly that I reject. Okay? Because all millennialists just kind of say the Bible's an allegory. It really doesn't mean what it says. And if it fits, we, if we can make it fit, it fits. And we spiritualize it and, and basically don't believe what the Bible says. Okay? Now, there's another group of people that are called... Now, listen, everyone... I'm giving a, a sentence definition to something that they write books, volumes and volumes. All you got to do is just start reading on this subject, okay? And somebody say, and I am least qualified to do it because I spend less time probably on the end times than most pastors do. You want to know why? Because I'm more worried that you get on the bus no matter when it leaves than I am when it leaves, okay? I just know it's going to leave, now, there's another group, okay, the premillennialist. Man, I can't pronounce things. Man, okay, I wish you had a pastor who had, you know, could do 12 letter words, okay? But premillennialists believe that Jesus Christ will return to earth prior to his etern prior to his literal reign on earth for a thousand years. Now, these groups, okay, there are three groups that fit within the premillennialist. And we are premillennial in our view. Okay? Most evangelicals are, if not all of them. Survey done by Lifeway um, uh, research uh, found that 36% uh, hold the one view. So it's not like it's this dominant view. I'm going to get to, I got some of you like, what, what view? Okay? Okay? So I'm going to mention quickly the three views, and then I'll tell you where mine is. I don't think it's fair for me just not to say. Okay? Post-tribulation uh, 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 view, okay? Believe that the rapture will occur at the end of the seven-year tribulation spoken of in Revelation, predominantly. Okay? That then the church will be raptured, the millennial kingdom will begin. Then there's the mid-tribbers, Okay? Midway through the tribulation, three and a half years, the church will be raptured out and the great tribulation will begin. The last three and a half years of the tribulation, guys, are hell on earth. Absolute total hell. Things are unbearable. Okay? Then there's the pre-trib. Okay? They believe that the rapture will occur prior to the seven-year tribulation, but not necessarily immediately before the tribulation. So the church can be taken out. There will be a time of peace because all those dirty, rotten Christians are gone. The Spirit of God is left and, or has left the building, and they kind of have peace, and the Antichrist rises to the top, and all hell breaks loose. Okay? That is the, uh, the three predominant views in evangelical Christianity. Now, again, well, listen, we can all differ. Because we all agree, though, that the rapture is going to occur. We all agree that there's going to be a literal reign of Christ here on earth. Okay? And it is not a salvation issue. Paul's point was not to give readers a timeline or literal description of how the end will occur. It was to remind us that the end will occur. That every person will stand before God and every person will give an account for their life. Okay? And it's going to happen. It could happen right now. Or if God tarries, it could happen another thousand years from now. So where does your pastor stand? Okay. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 18 says this. So encourage one another with these words. We need to encourage each other. These are words of encouragement, not discouragement. 
If you look up just two verses ahead to verse 16, it says, The Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, Christians who have died will be raised from their graves. There are those who contend that the trumpet of God mentioned here in 1 Thessalonians also refers to the seventh trumpet of Revelation, which is a signal of the rapture. It's the end. It's over. It's done. Okay? Revelation 11.15 says this, Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there, and then there were loud voices shouting in heaven. The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and His Christ, and He will reign forever and ever. Amen. I'm looking for that day. The last trumpet, the last sound, it's done. We're forever in heaven. But I do not believe, okay, that the church is present here. Many reasons the church is present during the tribulation, during this time. Again, I don't believe that is the case. The trumpets of Revelation 8 through Revelation 11 are blown by angels. They are blown by angels. But the trumpet in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is, a, is the trumpet of God. The same trumpet that Paul refers to as the last trumpet, the ending of an age, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, referring to what I believe is the rapture. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 52, It will happen in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we who are living will also be transformed. I see these 1 Thessalonians, and 1 Corinthians is parallels, talking of the same thing. God sounded the first trumpet when He gathered the, the Jews to Mount Sinai in Exodus 19. On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed and dense cloud came down from the mountain. There was a long blast from a ram's horn, horn and all the people trembled. That is when they called the Israelites when God called the Israelites to the mountain in the giving of the law. And I believe that He will sound the last trumpet before He gathers those who, become, who became believers this side of the trumpet. 1 Thessalonians, For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God, the first Christians who have died will be raised from their graves. And G Jesus in John chapter 16, verse 33 says, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take courage, I have overcome the world. Listen, in this world we have tribulation. We have it from Satan, we have it from our own flesh, and from others within this world. The tribulation of Revelation 6 through 19 is the time when God pours out His wrath and judgment on a Christ-rejecting sinful world. Certainly God is not saying throughout your life you're going to face all kinds of tribulation, Satan, your flesh, the world. And then I'm going to pour out my wrath, my tribulation upon you. I believe that as Christians, we will not go through the tribulation. That is a comforting word to me. It brings peace. Comfort one another with these words. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we will live together with Him. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 9 and 10. Paul said, God has not appointed us to wrath because we're so good looking, we're so perfect, we've arrived, not at all. 
See, the wrath that should have come upon us came down upon Jesus Christ at Calvary. The Bible says He took our wrath upon Himself. He took our punishment, which we deserve. So consequently, I believe that we are not ordained for the wrath of the Lamb, but for His marvelous salvation and His glorious work that was completed at Calvary. Different views, different opinions. One Lord. Here's the deal. If you don't know Him, it doesn't matter what you believe or when you think it will happen. The only thing that you're assured of is that you will miss the boat. So let me ask you this morning, do you know Jesus? Because you see, one day, one day, the trumpet will sound, the angel will shout, and we'll be caught up in the air to be with him. Those of us who know Jesus, that is. Here's the bottom line. We don't know when it's going to happen, folks. But I'm looking for that moment in that day. And I want to live in a manner that will please my Savior.